All right, we're live. Hey, folks, uh, thanks for tuning in today. I am uh, honored to announce that I have Dr. Charlie Weingroff here with me today. And we are going to talk about this whole idea of pressing reset or pressing the reset button. Uh, I actually first heard of this uh, working with Charlie about two years ago now, and I thought, you know, there's, there's nobody better to go to uh, for this information than Charlie, at least that I could think of. So, Charlie, how, how you doing? What's up? I'm doing well, Pat. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me, as always. My, uh, my pleasure. Um, so let's start off with this, Charlie. Could you uh, just give uh, a brief background of, of yourself, you know, what it is, what you do, what you specialize in, and then, uh, and then we'll get right into it. Yeah, well, I've gotten into the habit of, of now describing myself as a strength and conditioning coach that knows how to deal with pain and serious dysfunction, except I think there's a lot of other people that probably think they're doing that and they're really not. So uh, I am uh, I do have my clinical doctorate in physical therapy. I've been a physical therapist now for almost 15 years. And uh, that being said, that's my formal education, but I've always either worked as a certified athletic trainer or a strength and conditioning coach in professional sports or similar environment like the Marine Corps Special Operations. So that's that's kind of like what I do and, and it leads me to, to always look at things very, very holistically. I think there's a lot of very skilled uh, healthcare professionals, physical therapists, chiropractors, physicians, etc. Uh, but they don't always see the big picture. I look at I look at things very differently um, f uh, from a strength and conditioning perspective. I look at everything from the right. Uh, I want to see the perfect program with minimal logistics and then scale backwards. Mm -hmm. And that usually leads to an intervention or a program that looks a lot more like strength and conditioning, quote unquote, than it does physical therapy, quote unquote. So mm -hmm. the, the uh, that's kind of that's my background in terms of how I think and how I go about things. And uh, it's just uh, it's 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 part of how things are, are foundationally driven and how I think. That's that's awesome. And, you know, if, if everybody that I've, you know, studied with or studied on, I, you know, your philosophy has definitely affected mine the most. Before I forget, do you have any cool events coming up uh, at all recently on the East Coast or anywhere? Are you going to be, you're going to usually perform better, are you not? Yeah, I don't know that the uh, I don't know that the summits have been announced yet, but I'm scheduled to be at all three summits, which will be Providence, Chicago, and uh, and Long Beach. I don't have the dates in front of me, and uh, um, but I'm sure maybe by the time we're done, we can find them. And for the Perform Better One Day events, I'll be in Charlotte in February, and I will be in Boston in March. So uh, there's a, obviously I got a couple other things. I think I'm in. Uh, Chattanooga, beginning of February. Uh, the fir very first time since I've gone on this uh, speaking thing, I'll be in New Jersey to in, in Somerset. Uh, a fellow named Brian Smith will be hosting hosting me for a weekend, and uh, I think yeah, I don't know if it's within the 50 mile radius from where I live because obviously you're not an expert when you're within 50 miles. That's <laughs> pretty funny. I never. Yeah, you know, I'm nobody uh, when it when I'm close to home. Uh -huh. But uh, I'm I'm sure I'm missing something, and if I am, I I apologize. Uh -huh. But uh, these are uh, these are the things that uh, I'll be doing over the next several months. Uh, yeah, and it, for, if anybody who listens to this has not seen Charlie yet, it is an absolute treat. We had him down to our place. Um, oh man, almost almost a year and a half ago now. Is that how long it was? No, it could have been that. No, I think it's around. It's uh, six months a ago. Under a year. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah a little under a year. year. And it was just an incredible workshop. He covered a lot of material we're going to be talking about today. So if you ever get the chance to, to go out and, and you know see Charlie speak, definitely definitely do yourself that favor. So let's get right down into it. Um, you know what I want to talk about today is sort of this vague term that that's sort of getting thrown around now of of pressing the reset button or pressing reset. And it's funny because you know everyone's using this term now, uh, at least you know a fair amount of people. And I first heard this term when I was when I was doing work with you uh, in the South about two years ago, and I jacked myself up. And I specifically remember you putting me through a series of drills and saying, "Press the reset button." And that's the first time I heard that. Now I see it popping up everywhere. So you know, I tip my hat to you for being you know well ahead of the curve there. Um, but could you explain what this idea of pressing the reset button is to like the non-physical therapist? How how would you explain exactly what it is and why it's important? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think uh, it, I, obviously I can picture myself and probably hear myself using this terminology. But when we were prepping for this, I even said that I can't. I don't think I use this terminology that much 
anymore. It's not. It's not. It's not something that I disagree with. And so, so it's very important because yeah, I know some other people might be using this term. It's not even one that I use a lot. So it's uh, not, whoever I stole it from. Uh, you know, I don't know. But uh, this whole this whole idea that of uh, pressing the reset, control alt delete. Uh, a lot of times that the some of the what appe what what we struggle with in expressing musculoskeletal force production or range of motion or even uh, perceptions of pain, which often have nothing to do with any musculoskeletal, these are all driven uh, through the central nervous system. They manifest through the peripheral nervous system, but they're all driven through the brain. Mm -hmm. And when we have a technique or a method that even, as long as it is, we can always say what we're trying to do, but this again is not provable. I can think I'm doing something. I can think I'm following this particular schematic mm -hmm. or this particular paradigm to create a desired effect or adaptation. No matter what we do, whether we can prove it, whether we can't prove it, what you can certainly make the supposition is that all these interventions are affecting the brain. Mm -hmm. Whether we're looking for uh, uh, musculoskeletal adaptations that can be proven through biopsy, then the brain allowed this to happen. Our, the target organ of everything that we do is the brain. Mm -hmm. So pressing reset, control, alt, delete is perhaps an approach all the way down to scale to a specific technique that is not geared toward directly changing the peripheral nervous system's expression, but rather the central nervous system's control over that expression. That's what so, this means, and it, it, usually, uh, it usually is geared towards very specific neurocentric techniques. Mm -hmm. So, so in, in short, um, you know, what we're coming at is, is movement, you know, all movement, movement originates at the brain and in order to sort of, you know, correct the movement pattern, then, then you, you said it, we, we ought to target the brain. Is that, is that sort of what you're saying? This is, uh, I'm guessing, because uh, again, this is not a term that I use very liberally, uh, I am guessing that this is probably what most people will mean by that. It, it's what I would mean by that, where I am trying to change the brain's control over a mechanism that is either below standard and we're trying to bring it up to minimum or it's at minimum or above and we're trying to get better at it. We're trying to pull the parking brake uh, or off of the off of this the body's expression of movement or force or, or whatever it may be. Now you talked about standard or minimum standard and I know you are a huge advocate of the functional movement screen. Is that is that always your sort of go to system for, for measuring and assessing standards? Hundred percent. It's just, it's as simple as that. The it is a, I think at this point it is unfortunately a very misunderstood approach on, on the part of a lot of people, but the way you said it is exactly how it is. This is the standard that I am using, and how I choose to affect that standard is has nothing to do with what is uh, disseminated via the function movement system. So uh, when I see the function movement system is beneath the standard, or in this, uh, whether it's in the FMS or in the SFMA, where there's an finding the, the constructs that from painful and non-painful dysfunction, then this is the standard that, that I try to measure against. And as I've said many times before, we need some kind of standard. This stacks up, and in my experience, it stacks up better than other pieces that are available simply because of its breadth and depth of what it what it what it is based upon, which is the four tenets, is the neurodevelopmental perspective pain and motor control, high threshold strategy, and regional interdependence. Mm -hmm. So there are many other systems that have uh, a combination uh, percentage of those four. I don't know anything else that has all four of those principles, and that's why part of why I use the FMS. It, it, it's the best tool that in order to standardize movement and, and then blend this training and fitness uh, capacity approaches with rehabilitation or competency approaches. I think that's probably one of the most accurate and thorough descriptions of the FMS that I've ever heard. I just I just recently attended the level two workshop uh, with Brett Jones. I thought it was wonderful. Uh, you know, I'm I'm a huge advocate of the functional movement screen as well. When we were working on that with with when we had you down for the seminar, uh, it was just you know it, it it's so simple. Uh, and, and like you said, uh, you know people sort of have begun to misconstrue or misinterpret what the FMS is. Uh, but it really is, you know, you got to have standards. You really, you just, you have to have standards. 
Well, I think we uh, will. I'll always speak for myself, though. Uh, and I've had the ability. You know, I've been a, a, a formal instructor for the FMS on more than one occasion. And the, nonetheless, we have to take the responsibility that if people are, you know, disseminating, re-disseminating this information incorrectly, then we have to look at ourselves as instructors. And uh, it, it's it's unfortunate, but hopefully at least when I get an opportunity to talk about my interpretations of what I have learned then this is this is this is what it is and uh, I just presented at the Special Operations Medical Association in Tampa earlier this week mm -hmm. and in the question and answer the moderator of the session asked well what do you think the drawbacks and I'm like well I don't want to come off like a shill uh, <laughs> but I'm not sure I'm not sure there's as many drawbacks as people think like I can talk about limitations but are they really limitations if they're not supposed to be these inclusions in the system in the first place? Mm -hmm. So, for instance, when people say, well, it doesn't tell me enough, it doesn't tell me everything, is that a limitation or is it just me going to say, well, dude, it's not supposed to tell you everything? Mm -hmm. So is that really a limitation? Well, if you are going to only use this and nothing else in order to begin to put your puzzle together, then, yeah, of course it's a limitation. But uh, you know, it, it, because it does not diagnose a you why uh, is that a limitation? No, no, because it never really, to it never really, um, you know, had you, you know, it never really told you that this was supposed to be part of the of of what this tool was supposed to tell you in the first place. So mm -hmm. uh, I do think that there's a lot, but also with all due respect, there's a lot of people that teach themselves. There's a lot of people that take distance learning when there's nothing wrong with distance learning, but maybe they do need a more formal didactic setting in order to accurately procure the message. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of pieces, but for me, I would say that this is the best out there, and I'm also very confident in, in what uh, my exposures to other options and I haven't seen anything better. So until we find that, I wish someone else would share it. But then you need to start that discussion. Well, you need to start that discussion with, okay, I got something better. Well, what does it have for one, two, three, and four that we mentioned before? And if it doesn't have one, two, three, and four, is not better. So yes. that's, that's that's just how it is. Uh -huh. Agreed. And yeah, that's that's great to know. So Charlie Weingroff is an advocate of the FMS. That's what he uses to assess standards. Awesome. So let's um. So let's not let's take it a step further then, and you know let's say we're using the FMS. You know let's say that that we discover a dysfunctional pattern and say um you know, let's just take 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 make it easy and say the deep squat or whatever. Um, now you know a traditional school of thought or whatever. When I was you know taking my you know kinesis classes, you know knee caving in, uh, glute medius. I will give credit to uh, my biomechanist professor later on. Who, is set, who, who did come around and say, all right, maybe it isn't glute medius, maybe it's actually linked to the brain. And that's, and, and, and that's, and that's what this is all about that we're going to talk about here is, is that, you know, maybe it's not the fault of, of a weak muscle, but, but maybe it's, it's the programming of the brain. Is, is that accurate? That's, a, that's totally accurate, but it's both. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and with the one exception of, of the few things that you said, it is not a weak muscle. You do not know this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way to make this suggestion because... If a muscle is weak, then it, meaning it is simply not capable of exerting force, then this would be the case across every single movement pattern in which you ask that muscle to express force. Mm -hmm. So if you think your knee, if your knee is caving in uh, because that your glute medius is weak, uh, then the uh, uh, you would put somebody in a old school selectorized pin machine and they would also be weak there in a hip abduction or hip external rotation exercise in which they're not weak they mm -hmm. can move you know very very commensurate amounts of weight so it, when when we see that these EMGs are deficient in something like glute medius which goes back to the Chris Powers literature this is not wrong like this is not false Biomechanics and EMG do not lie, but they are not telling us the whole story mm -hmm. because even though the EMG, which is an expression of force at that in that particular uh, movement, which is very very specific to that movement, this is different than the muscle's physiological ability to create force. So we will never use the word weak. I will say that no, someone is weak if they cannot stand up. Mm -hmm. they, they're weak if they cannot lift their hand to their mouth to feed themselves. These are muscles are clearly weak. Mm -hmm. But if muscles are down or inhibited because the brain has identified correctly or incorrectly that the system is under stress 
and the body is going to attempt to protect itself from committing force and moving into a perception or a threat of pain or an environment where the muscles will not be able to exert force, then this is different than weakness. This mm -hmm. is inhibition. This is uh, down regulation of muscle. But it doesn't mean the muscle is weak. And then part of this whole neurological construct, if you can set up a different environment with different levels of proprioceptive input and all of a sudden it changes right away, well, we also know that we do not develop strength in muscle that fast. But what you can change is motor control mm -hmm. that fast. And at this point, the, if you can change the brain's perception of the environment, then it may begin to upregulate a muscle that was downregulated. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much the strength of the muscle, but rather the environment in which the brain allows it to exhibit the force. I, I think that's a great segue into this, this the into into some of the, the things we're going to get into now, because you said proprioceptive input or a new proprioceptive environment. And, and this all sort of originates at the vestibular system, correct? I don't think it has to. I don't think it has to. I think the vestibular uh, system is one avenue of input, mm -hmm. uh, but it does not have to be the only avenue of input. You could also argue that it is, everything is everything. Mm -hmm. So if I do, it, it, now th this, is, this is where things get really fuzzy because uh, if I'm a vestibular guy and I happen to use techniques that I have learned that, uh, that, that, are, that are supposed to have a direct impact on the vestibular system, that's fine. This is okay. Number one, you cannot prove that it only affects the vestibular system, especially when you're auditing a musculoskeletal movement pattern. Mm -hmm. uh, so I don't think it only has to be the vestibular system, yet everything is the vestibular system. Mm -hmm. Just like, And you can say this about any um, anything. So if you needed one word that would encompass anything that we do, maybe sensory motor is the is the right way to, to, to say it. Okay, all right. So so if we're going to affect uh, sensory motor, the sensory motor system, or or, or whatever, you know, if yeah, it's not it's not a system. It's yeah, it's 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 not one of the ten systems of the body. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking. So but, sensory, it's just sensory motor, I guess, is what we'll just refer to it. Yeah. As if we're going to try and affect that, uh, what are some things that we can do? Well, let's actually backtrack a little bit. So, if we want to increase proprioception, or if we want to uh, create improve, a you, improve. Yeah, you cannot. Yeah, in, yeah I don't. I, you know, pro proprioception is all relative. So mm -hmm. you cannot. Uh, I don't think you can improve. Uh, you can't increase. You can improve. You can improve. So yeah. So you either you either have deficient or in, inefficient or efficient. You know, levels of proprioception for desired output. So, so what's it's, so would it be accurate to say somebody with um, inefficient proprioception would would be perhaps more clumsy than somebody with more efficient proprioception? They could be. It, it's just, uh, it could be, but you don't know. You don't know for sure. <laughs> you, sure. Because that because that person actually, in fact, if you look at the literature, and I'll select when I use the literature and when I don't because I can, uh, you, you will find that when people, let's say, are clumsy or they're exhibiting a musculoskeletal expression that is below standard, uh -huh. and you blame proprioception, you will actually find that in only 7% of the cases are the proprioceptors, the, mecha the specialized nerve endings in the body, mechanoreceptors, uh -huh. only 7% of the time are they the problem. Really? The problem, the problem is somewhere else. Uh -huh. So... It's not that the, the Pacinian corpuscles or the Meisner's nerve endings or the Merkel cells are doing anything wrong. They are, mm -hmm. functioning, they are functioning absolutely at 100% capacity without error. The error is happening somewhere else, whether it's a central processing uh, error or somewhere along the neural pathways of the fascia and or spinal cord. So that's where the problems lie in 93% uh, of the of these clumsiness cases. So you cannot say this, and plus you must also uh, be, be prepared to, to, to make at least pass it off if we're a fitness professional or even a, a traditional healthcare professional, that if this is a, uh, not just a central processing problem, but a legitimate central lesion, so this is somewhat of a uh, TBI that is still uh, happening, mm -hmm. or some kind of true uh, uh, cerebellar lesion, then this is this must get put into the hands of someone competent very very quickly. Mm -hmm. So and at which point you can do you can try as much 
press the reset all you want, but you're obviously going never going to have. It's not going to happen. Uh, yeah, so let's so just backtrack real, real quick. Uh, what is how do you define proprioception? Just so we're all so we come to terms on that. I think uh, by definition, I cannot argue about the body's awareness in, uh, of 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 space. Uh -huh. uh, I'm, I think it's 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 uh, in a very different way of explaining it. I think proprioception can mean uh, the is is everyone is are all the different systems that affect the locomotor system, all the different body parts of the body. Are they all speaking the same language, and they are are they all speaking at a volume where they can all hear each other. This is what proprioception is. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it, this, this then equates, and then this equals your awareness of where your body is in space. I got and it. if you have this ideal awareness of, every, of all of your surroundings that impact the locomotor system, then you will have this ideal or efficient uh, presentation of proprioception. So I like that. I've never heard that before. So the outcome is awareness. So, so the yeah, outcome is awareness, but, pro <laughs> but proprioception in itself is, is how things talk to each other. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think pro proprioception cannot be uh, good or bad. It's just what it is at the moment. Uh -huh. And is it, is it good enough for your desired response? So then we input. And, and anything that we do is a proprioceptive input. We are looking to improve or diminish you know, no we're looking to change we're looking to change the current status of proprioception that's mm -hmm. and and if we can if we can create if we can change the current status to be more efficient then then we have done this this press the reset button. excellent okay. so let's 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 take it the other way then we said you know all right maybe clumsiness isn't always attributed to inefficient proprioception but what what might be attributed to inefficient proprioception it, again, this this is uh, I, I think people are always looking for like really clean bucketed responses. Uh huh. Anything, anything can anything be anything and everything. Anything. So so you can so I I look at things and there's there's three perspectives in which to look at movement: biomechanical, neuromuscular, neurodevelopmental, and they all kind of have like different rules to them, if you will. So mm -hmm. what what can limit the body's uh, proprioceptive efficiency from a biomechanical model? Obviously, if if I have a positional fault or a dislocated or subluxated joint. This will begin uh, to to change you know, how my how my body uh, perceives itself in space. Uh, if I have a perception of pain for whatever reason, whether it is related to the biomechanical construct or not, this can affect uh, my my proprioception. And the evidence of pain and motor control is very very strong. Mm -hmm. uh, from a neuromuscular system, uh, if it is one of the seven percent of the time. Time where these specialized mechanoreceptive nerve endings are not reading information properly. Maybe they don't read it at all. Maybe it's hypersensitive. Uh, maybe it's it's hyposensitive. In which these uh, the the feedback mechanisms uh, that the body has set up to tell our brain uh, about proprioception, if they're not working ideally, then 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 uh, then this can be the case. But remember that the, when those nerve endings uh, pick up information, they they don't just go right to the brain. They have to travel through other nerves, and those nerves uh, travel through the body's fascia. Mm -hmm. So if the body's fascia is not gliding properly, then this is where the the static or the traffic in the system can can occur. Mm -hmm. And there's a myriad of different uh, approaches, therapies, movement strategies that can affect the, the, the fascia's ability to slide on each other. The contemporary view of fascia is that it has multi-layers. And if they do not move transversely upon each other, almost through a shearing process, mm -hmm. then they don't, then, then it, this, is, this is where the, the nerves will not glide and get stuck, if you will. And uh, that when the message travels through there, the nerve impulse uh, travels through this area where there's not this efficient sliding, then the message gets garbled and the brain does not react uh, 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 properly. Uh, so this is, this is an option. If you do not have adequate joint mobility, meaning your, your joint capsules are stiff, 
the muscles or tendon, tendons around the joints are stiff. The joints have enormous volume of these, these key proprioceptors. So if they are not regularly receiving the types of inputs mm -hmm. that they're supposed to receive, then the brain doesn't get the information and then it starts to upregulate or downregulate, facilitate or inhibit key muscles that happen in a reliable fashion. Mm -hmm. um, the third perspective, the neurodevelopmental perspective, which is you know the fanciest, it's the coolest, and it's just one piece of the puzzle, yet one that's incredibly powerful. If we uh, if we did not develop through the to the the key milestones um, that span from the day we're born up to maybe four years old, then uh, and we did not go through these, these patterns and we did not load our bodies in a very systematic way through key points of our bodies and key positions and key, key movements, then our brain did not get the feedback in which to change the shapes of our bones and then this, this structure that we are leading with as vertical adults does not allow us to have the efficient levels of proprioception. So they're all, they're all many, many different ways in which proprioception can be uh, impacted uh -huh. and they are all warranted, they're all correct, I think if we only look at biomechanics, then we are unfortunately terribly incomplete. Yeah. Uh, however, however, biomechanics is the easiest to uh, to talk about for dumb people. It's the <laughs> easiest to uh, it, and it's the easiest to prove in research, uh -huh. which is for lazy people. Yep. So it, it, if if you're looking to be challenged and uh, and and put a little bit more mental energy into the game. Uh -huh. uh, you'll move up the ladder in taking a neuromuscular or a neurodevelopmental perspective. I love it. I, I love your take on it, and it's it's great. And, and you know, wow, what what a wealth of information. So I guess then, this if we're going to go neurodevelopment and and neuro, this this is sort of where uh, we see. This is, is and correct me if I'm wrong, but is this is this why Gray Cook brought in the the rolling and the crawling into uh, sort of the the corrective regimen, if you will. Well, I, I'm not going to speak for Gray, and I, I think you know why does anybody bring anything into their approach? Well, because it works. Yeah. And if we're looking for an explanation as to why some of these ground-based quote unquote primitive patterns work, uh, it's because you've got more parts of your body touching the ground, and we are now picking up. Uh, uh, key pieces of proprioceptive input through the ground mm -hmm. and because when we look at how babies develop and if they develop normally then we know that they're doing it within a very very typical and predictable range so with with so many things being good about those things uh, we can we actually actually do have quite a bit of I guess we'll call it uh, a face validity or you know, em empirical evidence that if we can engage some of these patterns in training, uh, whether it be for capacity or for, for competency, then, then we see success. So I'll assume that's ultimately why Great Cook includes these things in his system is because they work. Sure. And why they, why they work is for a number of different reasons. Now, now you said previously that, you know, maybe if we miss these patterns, uh, you know, through our developmental phases, and you know now, and it affected us in our adulthood to, the, to such that you know maybe our bones aren't you know structured the way they should be. Can regressing and going back and doing these patterns uh, can that help us? What can, what can that do for us? It, it it absolutely can help, and even though we will never change the structure of bone the same way that we would change it as babies there is some evidence to support that you can change structure over time. We're not going to take a a 58-year-old attorney and, and reverse his kyphosis by crawling, mm -hmm. uh, but you can make other types of, of changes structurally. And I, again, I think there's probably some, I think if you put enough people in the room, the truth actually exist. So I think unfortunately all those people probably don't talk to each other enough. Mm -hmm. And they might live in other professions or or other uh, trains of thought. But the bottom line is I'm going to tell you that I do not know exactly what is happening when we engage these primitive patterns and have very specific parts of our body in contact with the ground, which in turn allows us to have a very, very specific range of joint position, which we'll call joint centration, uh, which is uh, maximal congruency of two joints, maximum weight bearing in a passive position of a joint. When this happens, the brain obviously is being is responding in a very very positive way. Mm -hmm. And how do we know this? 
you do X and then you test it with Y and Y is better whether you're faster stronger uh, you have a better expression of endurance or you move better by these standards this is what's happening mm -hmm. and the the key is to the, the, this joint centration and maximum load bearing from a passive approach uh, allows the body to unlock these mechanisms and it, it this all go this all returns its ground into motor control except it seems when you use these traditional um, neurodevelopmental approaches regardless of the commercial model they do seem to skip steps in terms of of the the motor control process They're, the the learning appears to be accelerated mm -hmm. and uh, and I'll also tell you that if for me in my practice I don't see that it works all the time but you, there's there's so much money involved in these patterns that there's no reason why not to do them. Sure. So, for, for example, just to put this in some context, and I'll just steal uh, exactly what you had us do when you came down and worked with us last June. Um, let's take rolling and pressing, for example. So one way to test it would be to do some simple soft rolls or hard rolls on the ground and then go test it with a military press. Is, is that a viable option? Yeah, and, and let's we can use that example. So these are both... Uh, um, hard style, you know, expression via the the press, and these are very soft approaches that we see in correcting rotary stability or other patterns in the functional movement system. So, if, if indeed, if indeed that you were able to press more, well, you did not get stronger in your arm or any of these muscles that you were pressing with. Mm -hmm. But the the particular intervention that you chose to use, segmental rolling with your arm or leg. In order to execute that movement, number one, you need joint mobility. And about seven minutes ago, I said that you require joint mobility and these joints to move through a very large range of which they're physiologically meant to do, then these proprioceptors will get the information that they're set up to get. Mm -hmm. And they're going to get good good wealth of information about where your body is in space. It's then going to tell the brain, hey, these, mo these joints are able to, to move really, really far. The key with that particular movement in terms of rolling is that you cannot use your big pressing muscles. Mm -hmm. You cannot use your phasic muscles. You cannot use muscles that typically we need to express force, power, strength, etc. You can only use deep stabilizing muscles. But what happens is that when the body doesn't get the correct proprioceptive input, it does not allow it downregulates these deep stabilizing muscles. So then our big pressing muscles become stabilizers. And this is exactly what's called a high threshold strategy. How it happened, it can happen for a number of different reasons, but if you are able to execute rolling because you had the joint mobility, okay, so you get in the room and then you start to execute correctly and then you get up and you can press more. The reason is because now you've got stabilizing muscles that are doing the stabilizing and you've got your phasic muscles to blast the bell overhead. Mm -hmm. Previously, before the rolling, you were using some of your phasic muscles to be stabilizing, mm -hmm. and you did not have as much of those phasic muscles, those motor units that could be dedicated towards moving your shoulder when some of them were used to keep your shoulder still and stop it from separating. So this is why sometimes using these low patterns in which it's very difficult to use the wrong muscles to execute, you do that, reset the system this way, you get up and you blast it, and you're good. Like, you don't have to go back to doing these rolling. That's the problem. People want to keep doing these, these soft systems. Once you train the soft systems and you have minimum competency, mm -hmm. you go. You go. You don't have to keep doing these things sure. because nobody's losing weight or getting strong from doing these, these very low. Um, so these are things to consider, but that, that's why uh, if you were able to press more, and, and I don't remember, but you'll tell me, if, if a lot of people in the room were able to press more or do something better uh, from a ridiculous looking movement, mm -hmm. it's because you're, it, you could never do that ridiculous movement the mm -hmm. wrong way. Yes. You could do it wrong if you didn't have joint mobility. But now you see that if you can go through joint mobility and do so in a fashion that only allows you to use deep stabilizing muscles, then you're going to reset the system and have a lot of lot of big time force production. And, and the answer, in case anybody is wondering, is yes. Uh, you know, people saw huge changes in performance when we didn't just test this with the press. We tested with a couple things, and it, you know, people people were in awe. It was sort of like it was almost like voodoo. Yeah. Well, I, at least I. I explained to but, you why, at least why I think that this could have been successful for you. But yeah, but but clearly it's not. Clearly, there's really something going on. And let's let's actually go back because you you said two words that I want to again come to terms on and just get your definition of tonic muscles and phasic muscles. 
yeah, so again, uh, just like everything I'm saying, it's, it's certainly up for debate, but uh, uh, tonic muscles, and every muscle in the body can be tonic, meaning it is going to have a longer term stabilizing effect over the body's control, uh, and a phasic muscle, which will be meant to move the body. So perhaps we know, we talked about glute medius before, uh, if I want it to be phasic, it would abduct the body. Yeah, I'm sorry, it would abduct the, the femur. Mm -hmm. But if uh, ideally, when we talked about that knee caving in business, well, that's not abduction. That's actually no movement. It's isometric in order to prevent hip internal rotation in the squat pattern. So if I can ask it to prevent movement, then it would be tonic. And if there's a rule of thumb, if you take your hands and rub it all up and down your body, all the muscles that you're touching are phasic. This is a rule of thumb. It may not always be correct. Mm -hmm. um, the muscles that you cannot touch, like you cannot touch glute medius, it's covered by your big glute max. Mm -hmm. So you, you, uh, this is, these would be tonic muscles. Tonic muscles are typically smaller. They're typically one joint muscles, and they're typically meant to control your body. Uh, it, the phasic muscles can be one or two joint muscles. They're larger, they're, they have multi, multiple pinations, and they're meant to, to drive your movement. They're meant to accelerate the body. Tonic muscles are meant to decelerate the body. So these are, when you change your body's position, uh, different muscles can become tonic or phasic based on the body's position. Uh, based on your particular movement pattern, the, what you choose to do, uh, they can become tonic or phasic. And then based upon the, the, body, the, the, the centration of your joints, different muscles will become tonic and phasic. But there is an ideal, and the ideal, again, as we mentioned before, I would measure that via the, uh, the functional movement screen and the selective functional movement assessment. Mm -hmm. There's many other tests that can determine if, if, uh, if particular muscles that we want to be tonic are acting as, as intended. That, that, that's awesome. That's, that's an awesome definition. I like that little rule of thumb too. That's um, that's very neat. It's just so, a rule of thumb, though, because you may not always be the case. Mm -hmm. So we, we talked about rolling a little bit. Let's yeah, so and then some of the other things you had us do in the seminar. Uh, we did the we did the rolls. We did we did a lot of crawling too, and we tested that, and we saw some you know pretty awesome benefits uh, and and very quick changes from crawling too. Does, is that is that pretty much the same effect that we're getting from rolling? How does that differ, and and when might we want to use some sort of Type of crawling or creeping in in our in yeah. our work. Well, again, again, you're gonna you're gonna requ again. It depends which kind of uh, um, methodical progressions that you're using. Different systems will you know give different levels of information uh, on how much passive or how much joint mobility you have before you go into particular exercises. But you obviously need some kind of requisite mobility in the hips and the shoulders uh, in order to go into rolling. But most of what we do vertically is with arms and legs moving around a stable spine. Mm -hmm. And that reverses uh, when we're crawling. When we're crawling, we have more rotation through the spine and, mo and less and more stability through the shoulders and the hips. Mm -hmm. So now as we explore more movement through the spine, much like a quadrupedal organism would be moving, you're able to then feed the body, feed the brain a little bit more information about the spine. If it stabilizes uh, a little bit more effectively with the local system, uh, then, then of course you're going to stand up and have some more juice. But there's quite a bit of biomechanical uh, ideals that, that crawling demonstrate through scapular stability, pelvic stability, etc. But now we're getting the insides of our knees, the insides of our wrists, the insides of our elbows all touching the floor. Mm -hmm. And now we've got more fixed points. And with more fixed points, not only are these key spots are very, very highly dense as antennas, if you will, for proprioceptive information, more fixed points allows the body to uh, maintain ideal centration. And when you can maintain ideal, ideal centration, I say can, doesn't mean that this will happen, you will then begin the motor learning process and maintain the centration in other positions up the, up the maturity process uh, in the neurodevelopmental perspective. So this is why ro rolling can be very, very valuable. But most importantly, you see tremendous effects of rolling, I'm sorry, of crawling, because it's, crawling is the same as walking. Uh, it's a contralateral locomotion pattern in the sagittal plane. So if you can, you know, the position of our position of our elbows and wrists, they, they should ideally be the same uh, in crawling as they are in walking mm -hmm. and, and, and in running. 
So if we can you know, maintain good joint position, tell the brain, hey, this is a good thing to do, then you get back up, and then your brain doesn't really know the difference between crawling and walking. So, and this is just, and I know this is very difficult for some people to, to swallow. Mm -hmm. I'm explaining to you why I do it. I'm explaining to you why I know it. Uh, I doubt you can tell me that I'm wrong. But nonetheless, I understand that sometimes this is difficult to swallow. I don't have a research paper to say this, uh -huh. um, and quite frankly, I don't care. So, this, but, but the brain doesn't know the difference between uh, these different positions, and this is why using these very low, immature movement patterns, with you, you, but you could also tie a sled up to your waist and pull the sled around crawling, and you're going to get in great shape doing that as well, yeah. and, and, prob and probably recover a lot quicker than if you chose to pull a sled up in the vertical. Mm -hmm. So, well, you're not getting ankle mobility out of that. All right, fine. Go get your ankle mobility somewhere else. I, I don't, like, I'm not telling you how to train. Uh, I'm giving you a reason as to why these uh, different patterns are very useful and why you may see success in the vertical from tra training in these lower patterns. Sure. I, I mean, that's fantastic information. So, um, some people would say, and this, and this, is, this is interesting because you brought this up a few minutes ago, is, yeah, do what you need to do to get the effect that you want, and then, and then leave it at that. Some people would say, do do crawl and roll every day, but but you but you're saying don't do it unless you have to. Is is or or am I wrong? Well, I think you can. Yeah, uh, how you define rolling? So those those uh, function movement system segmental rollings. No, I would not do those any more than they have to. They do not get harder. Like, uh -huh. There is not a capacity module for those particular answers. But what you can do is throw a med ball sideways, um, which would be rolling in a higher pattern. Mm -hmm. So you you would you would you would continue to add capacity to ipsilateral movement patterns, which is rolling and and you know all of our uh, racket and implement uh, uh, sports. This is now where you can progress rolling to. With crawling, again, if I'm using crawling to change competence in a pattern, which I can do, and again, how do I define crawling? Like most of us think of crawling and we're you know, moving from A to B. Crawling can be a number of different things depending on the, excuse me, depending on you know, what you know of and how you choose to define these things. Any, anything that's contralateral you know, can, be, can be considered a crawling pattern. But once you have a crawling pattern that is at minimum level, you know, you strap a band up to it. You put a weight vest on. You can, you know, we, we've been we've been uh, taking sand bells and kind of throwing them and right catching so. them um, as you're crawling. You're unlimited. You've mm -hmm. got uh, you've got elbows and knees, elbows and feet, which is a savage technique to mm -hmm. to, to to do some some uh, metabolic work with. You can do hands and knees. You can do hands and feet. You can go in three planes. Uh, mm -hmm. After, but these are all training capacity. They're yeah. not training competency. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to stop doing them, but you don't have to continue. It's up to you. Sure. I think when it comes to uh, uh, capacity training and getting people in great shape and fitness and strong and, and, and have tremendous capacity mm -hmm. to move, then this is, you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no onus to do anything. And then the more specific your task is, the more specific your training should be. If you're a general fitness person, it doesn't really matter what you do. Just get in shape or yeah. meet whatever your goals are. Uh, so you don't have to continue doing them, but you can. But I think when it comes to the soft rolling patterns that we see, uh, those are those are purely corrective. They don't have a capacity module to them. So so once I've increased my competency to where I want it to be, there's there's little utility or little additional returns to be had. Say for me, just crawling back and forth every time I go into the to, to the kitchen. This is this would be stupid. <laughs> yeah, and it would be humiliating, right? But <laughs> yeah, this is stupid. This is stupid. No one is saying that you should be crawling, you know, all, all the time. Uh, this is not a. Um, no, look, if if you have minimum competency, there is a tremendous value to crawling in a fitness program, uh -huh. uh, strength, a strength and conditioning program. You are. Who am I to tell you what to do? Like, this is not like this is not uh, this is not required. Uh huh. You can get a you can get a lot of good things out of it, and I think a lot of people have great success. That what was corrective uh, and necessary for them at one point then just becomes their warm up. Sure, yeah, that that's great. Now, just uh, you know, just a few more, and we got a, got a few more minutes here, and I, I definitely want to talk about some cool things you've been doing recently too. As far as other movements go, is to improve competency, to improve proprioception. We talked a little bit about rolling. We talked about crawling. Any other? ones that you'd really like to mention and talk about a little bit that, that you use a lot in your practice? 
Well, it's interesting if you uh, everything from a you know month zero through fourteen is either rolling or crawling. Uh, but then when you get up to your knees or one knee or your feet, everything is still either ipsilateral or contralateral. So ipsilateral means you have support on the same side, hip and shoulder. So you can appreciate how that's rolling. Uh, so now you can be throwing your med ball, uh, any any kind of throwing pattern um, outside of chest pass or soccer throw. But even soccer throw, if you take a step it automatically becomes a contralateral pattern. So mm -hmm. you should be able to look at every move, and I'd say 80, 85% of what we do vertically is either ipsilateral, contralateral, the other 15% would be considered a transition. Mm -hmm. And then you just say it depends what your next move is to, yeah. to, um, to call it ipsilateral, contralateral. So there's really no need to bucket things. You just need to evaluate the person and find out what they need. And if they need movement uh, competency, then you have this approach in which to achieve that. It happens very, very quickly. It also comes with a lot of faith that because you can't prove it. And I know there's a lot of people out there that don't care to go down that road. That's okay because it'll take much longer to succeed in, in making the changes. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then once you do have your minimum uh, levels of capacity, you take the same things. Uh, a lot of the lifts that we do to put general strength into the system are transition lifts. So. Um, a deadlift is very difficult to categorize as a ipsilateral or contralateral pattern. Um, but you know, the, in the neurodevelopmental perspective, the deadlift is a very real move, but it would be preceded with some other option. So baby would bend down to pick up a ball, and then it would either stay there and then start to use its hands in a reciprocal pattern, which would make that the next move contralateral. Mm -hmm. um, or it would you know, turn to the side and place the ball on a table next to him, which would then make an ipsilateral pattern. It doesn't matter anymore. Like, there's no, it, it's not a value. People take this stuff uh, way too far. Mm -hmm. uh, once you've got your minimum capacities, you just go. You, you go to work. You go hard. And, and, and there's absolutely no reason to be toying around with these very low developmental patterns. There's, there's, there's principles that, that uh, extrapolate very readily, particularly to the ipsilateral athlete, like the javelin thrower, the baseball pitcher, the lacrosse player, uh, et cetera. But beyond that, this is not useful. This, the principles is what's useful. I think, I think that's, uh, you've given us, a, a, well, you've at least given me a very clear perspective on all this stuff right now. Um, and it's awesome to hear from you, as always, um, because, you know, when you ask Charlie Weingroff, you get a straight answer, and, that, and that's what I love whenever I chat with you. Um, so, so let's do this. Uh, first off, uh, if anybody doesn't have Charlie's DVD, training equals rehab, rehab equals training, uh, you can get that at charliewinegroff.com. It is, it's just an amazing piece of work. But you actually have a, a new DVD out now with Patrick Ward, correct? Yes, Patrick Ward, myself, and Joel Jameson, and we were all at uh, End Zone Athletics in uh, wherever, somewhere in suburban Seattle where uh, Joel's uh, facility is, and we took a whole day. We each took uh, two one-hour lectures and tried to put together the foundations of what we would do to evaluate and begin to approach um, you know, athletic development. So it's yeah. a little bit different than my than my DVD, which was a lot of uh, competency-based approaches and giving you the backgrounds. At that time, when I did the DVD, it was really the biomechanical and the neuromuscular approaches. I really didn't have the handle that I think I do now on the neurodevelopmental perspective. Uh -huh. But with uh, with with Patrick and Joel, we were really ca uh, capacity-based, and I talked about using. Um, you know, continuing this ideal of testing, but really more than just movement, also testing uh, preparedness uh, through different technologies or even just body stability. How well prepared is the nervous system, not from a, a movement construct, but from a central nervous system construct, and are there things out there that we can use that allow us to determine if our training program that day is the right training program for that individual to succeed. How can we aggregately measure stress in the body from not only the movement tests that we know, but also from a, a central nervous system approach. And there's commercial stuff like Omega Wave and, and, the, uh, and BioForce, but there's also things like grip strength and the breathing pattern and vertical jump that also give us good information as biomarkers to determine the body's preparedness and we can then manipulate the training program uh, in that and you know, with these 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 are our targets uh, for tests pre-test and post-test 
And then I also talked about the sensory system. Uh, we've talked a lot about the sensory system in terms of tactile touch. Mm -hmm. And this is what can be exploited through using more uh, immature patterns like being on our backside, prone, crawling, et cetera, et cetera. And if we can evaluate the sensory vision, touch, and hearing obviously have the, the largest piece to the puzzle in terms of athletic development. If we can see better, uh, perhaps you know, the example that I use in terms of you know, why Nike has a big part in, in vision testing, if, the, if Ronaldo can see a blade of grass better than another soccer player and he sees that goalie um, inching to the left, but because he's 20 over 8 in his eyes and he can actually see things that other people can't see, if that blade of grass is moving in one direction, he can very easily make the goalie look foolish by kicking the, uh, the the goal kick into the other side. So mm -hmm. these are now the, obviously you have taste and smell, which don't have a direct impact to athletic development, but they're still coded in the prefrontal cortex. And if we can create successful training environments with particular smells, et cetera, that are duplicated in the environment of our competition, we may further cement this motor control process. So these are all things that I talked about. And then we did a little bit of a um, of an FMS. Um, you know, did it kind of off the cuff, hey, somebody come up, let's see if we can fix it. And uh -huh. we didn't see too much magic because I think the one fellow would tell me that he has pain and this is why changing movement in the presence of pain sometimes can be confusing. And then we took another fellow who just had a lot of very legitimate mobility restrictions. He did not have the proprioception to succeed with motor control that day, mm -hmm. and, uh, and we made some other suggestions for him, but you couldn't see the big magical changes sometimes you see with some other folks. And where Patrick and Joel, you know, took their time. Joel talked a lot, a lot about his product, BioForce, which uh -huh. is a fantastic uh, um, um, uh, phone app in which you can begin to measure your heart rate variability and also give you use that as a measure of your training intensities across a training. Program. Now, now, if you, if you don't mind me interjecting real quick, Charlie, because I think this is very important, and, um, and I don't want to spoil too much of, of what you guys talk about on DVD. Uh, but I know you're you you are a big advocate of of um, uh, of HRV, could you could you quickly explain w just what that is and why it's important? Well, by by definition, heart rate variability is the distance between key points of the um, the the heart rate cycle in which how different are they between between each beat, and if they are always the same difference. Then, then they will. Uh, you'll have a very low heart rate variability. If you've got a lot of differences, meaning you still might have 60 beats per minute, but if you have different space in between these beats, you'll have high variability. And what we found is that with a higher heart rate variability, you're measuring your cardiac function. So different different types of athletes will have different levels of cardiac function. If this heart rate variability changes, so if you have a good standard and you know where you're at and this is what you're supposed to be and it, it, it calculates to a number which is where things start to get debatable but it's re, you know somewhat reliable and when you see success um, not necessarily science but you know success is science mm -hmm. so if you if you start to see changes in your number then you have an ideal that you are under prepared uh, for a high intense training session. Maybe it also tells you you haven't been training hard enough if you're never getting into the overreaching phases of what uh, even back from 1930 when Selye talked about the uh, Selye's model of adaptation. You actually have to get into some level of failure for the body to adapt uh, for a similar stress the second time. So that's heart rate variability is a, by definition is a measure of cardiac function. Mm -hmm. But it's not, uh, it, we're also using it though by it, through an extrapolation because it's the autonomic nervous system that controls the vagus nerve, which then controls your heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. So if your autonomic nervous system is trying to get your body to, to recognize that it is overstressed, it will change heart rate variability. But this is not something you can see, feel, taste, etc. We sometimes need these to let, uh, these, these technologies of telemetry that can give us this type of information. Very, very cool. Um, and, and that's a little bit of what Joel talks about in the DVD. Yeah, yeah. So Joel talk, talks about heart rate variability. He talks about how the body adapts uh, to stress. And then he talks about, you know, co you know starting to develop a coding system um, using, using uh, Microsoft Excel uh, to start to put this information, to collect data on is your program working from this perspective, mm -hmm. from the preparedness perspective. So it's not to minimize the movement perspective that we've talked a lot about, but it's to you know, put these two together. And Patrick talks a lot about some other, other things in, in related to preparedness 
and, and what type of training is going to get you very specific types of adaptations. Very awesome. So, uh, by, by the way, I didn't even ask you, what's the name of the DVD, just so everyone knows? The, the name of the DVD is Strength in Motion, and you can find that at, uh, at strengthinmotion.com. Awesome. All right. Uh, any, um, and, and again, if, if, if anybody listening hasn't picked up uh, either Charlie's first DVD or the second one, do yourself the great favor and, and just and do that. Um, clearly, I mean, just, just the hour we spent here has just been a wealth of information. I'm going to go and re-listen to this again and again and again. Uh, any sort of uh, parting words of wisdom, Charlie? No, no, keep a neutral neck. How about that? <laughs> keep it back neck, right?